as we celebrate the birth of our nation and the establishment of the Constitutional Republic with, inter with intentionally limited powers, I want to share a few values of America's first president, George Washington, and his era, some things that strike me as ideals that are worth pursuing. Back in 1967, when I was in junior high school, my brother Ron and I visited our grandparents out in California. We went to Disneyland and we went to Knott's Berry Farm. At Knott's, which at that time was a low-key, history-based American heritage type of theme park, there were no wild rides in those days at Knott's Berry Farm, I bought a souvenir. This little book called The Americanism of Washington by Henry Van Dyke. It was originally published in 1906. That's 113 years ago. And it deeply influenced me 52 years ago when I first read this. It helped form my sense of civic values. So today's sermon is largely gonna consist of turn of the century oratory. Turn of the century of the last century, that is, 113 years ago. I used the word Americanism in my title this morning knowing full well that that's an antiquated word. The new rhetoric of, of make America great again has by and large supplanted what people used to think actually made America great in the first place. The values of Americanism. And how else can we talk about the true values of our nation's founders without sounding a little bit old fashioned? So I invite you to listen to these comments about George Washington, who used to be called the father of his country a man who served as the commander-in-chief of the American forces in the 1776 War for Independence, and who became our first elected president, as described now by Henry Van Dyke in 1906. I quote, Dignified and reserved he was, undoubtedly. And as this manner was natural to him, he won more true friends by using it than if he had disguised himself in a forced familiarity or worn his heart on his sleeve. But from first to last, Washington was a man who did his work in the bonds of companionship. He trusted his comrades in the great enterprise, even though they were not his intimates. He was not of the jealous type, nor of the temper of George III, who chose his ministers for their vacuous compliancy. Today we would call that cronyism. Washington was surrounded by men of similar, although not equal, strength. Benjamin Franklin, Hamilton, Knox, Green, the Adamses, Jefferson, Madison. He stands in history not as a lonely pinnacle like Mount Shasta, but as the central summit of a mountain range with all his noble fellowship of kindred peaks about him. Among these men, whose union in purpose and action made the strength and stability of the Republic, Washington was first, not only in the largeness of his nature, the loftiness of his desires, and the vigor of his will, but also in that representative quality which makes a man able to stand as the true hero of a great people. And yet, you shall hear historians describe him as a transplanted English commoner as the second edition of John Hampton does. You shall read in a famous poem about Lincoln, as I quote, the new birth of our new soil, the first American. Now, that Abraham Lincoln was one of the greatest Americans, glorious in the largeness of his heart, the vigor of his manhood, the heroism of his soul, none can doubt. But to affirm that Lincoln was the first American is to disown and to disinherit Washington and Franklin and Adams and Jefferson. General Washington knew that the Boston brewer, Samuel Adams, and the Pennsylvania printer, Ben Franklin, and the Rhode Island anchorsmith, and the New Jersey preacher, and the New York lawyer, and the men who stood with him were all Americans. He knew it, I say, by standards which disregarded alike Franklin's fur cap, Putnam's old felt hat, Morgan's leather leggings and Witherspoon's black silk gown and John Adams' lace ruffles. See, to recognize and approve beneath these various garbs 
the vital sign of America that's woven into the very souls of the men who belong to her by spiritual birthright. For what is true Americanism? And where does it reside? Not on the tongue, not in the clothes, nor among the transient social forms, refined or rude, which model the surface of human life. The log cabin has no monopoly on Americanism, nor is it an immovable fixture of a stately pillared mansion. Its home is not on the frontier, nor in the populous city. Its dwelling is in the heart. Americanism speaks a score of dialects, but one language. It follows a hundred paths, but to the same goal. It performs a thousand kinds of service in loyalty to the same ideal which is its life. True Americanism is this. One, to believe that the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are given by God to all. Two, to believe that any form of power that tra tramples on these rights is unjust. Three, to believe that taxation without representation is tyranny and a government must rest upon the consent of the governed and that the people should choose their own rulers. Americanism, four, is to believe that freedom must be safeguarded by law and order and that the goal of freedom is fair play for all. Five, to believe that the selfish interests of persons, classes, and sections of society must be subordinated to the welfare of the commonwealth. Six, to believe not that all people are good, but the way to make them better is to trust the whole people. Seven, to believe that a free state should offer an asylum to the oppressed and an example of virtue, sobriety, and fair dealing to all nations. Eight, to believe that for the existence and perpetuity of such a state, a man should be willing to give his whole service in property, in labor, and in life. That is Americanism an ideal embodying itself in a people. And it was the subordination of the personal to that ideal, to that creed, that vision, which gave eminence and glory to Washington and the men who stood with him. The men who were able to surrender themselves and all their interests to the pure and loyal service of the ideal were the men who made good. They were the victors crowned with glory and honor. The men who would not make that surrender, who sought selfish ends, who were controlled by personal ambition and the love of gain, who were willing to stoop to crooked means to advance their own fortunes, they were the failures, the lost leaders, and in some cases, the men whose names are embalmed in their own infamy. The ultimate secret of greatness is neither physical nor intellectual, but moral. It's the capacity to lose self in the service of something greater. It's the faith to recognize, the will to obey, and the strength to follow a star. Chosen to command the army of the revolution in 1775, Washington confessed to his wife his deep reluctance to surrender the joys of home. He acknowledged publicly his feeling that he was not equal to that great trust that was committed to him. And then accepting it as thrown upon him by a kind of destiny, he gave himself body and soul to its fulfillment, refusing all pay beyond the mere discharge of his expenses. Ah, but he was a rich man, cries the carping critic. He could afford to do so. <laughs> How many rich men today avail themselves of their opportunity to indulge this kind of extravagance, toiling tremendously without a salary, neglecting their own estate for the public benefit, seeing their property diminished without complaint, coming into serious financial embarrassment even within the sight of bankruptcy as Washington did, 
merely for the gratification of a desire to serve the people. This indeed is a very singular and noble form of luxury. Was it in any sense a misfortune for the people of America that there was a man who was able to advance $64,000 out of his own purse with no other security but his own faith in their cause to pay his daily expenses while he was leading their armies. This unsecured loan was one of the very things I doubt not, writes Henry Van Dyke, that helped inspire general confidence. Washington's substantial pledge of property to the cause of liberty was repaid by a grateful country at the close of the war, but not a dollar of payment for the tremendous toil of body and mind not a dollar for work overtime, for indirect damages to his estate, for the use of his name and the value of his counsel did he receive. Washington refused this and any other kind of pay saying he could serve the people better in the enterprise if he were known to have no selfish interest in it. I am sick, writes Henry Van Dyke, of the shallow judgment that ranks the worth of a person by his poverty or his wealth. Many a selfish speculator dies poor. Many an unselfish patriot dies prosperous. It's not the possession of the dollar that cankers the soul, it's the worship of it. The true test of a man is this. Has he labored for his own interest or for the general welfare? Has he earned his money fairly or unfairly? 